Talk Recorded live. Hello, folks. This is Mike, Mike again, and I'm with uh, Jorg from the Jugular 66. Uh, Going to have another conversation, and um, Jorg has a lot. Uh, sounds like a lot of information to share with you, and and uh, I think we'll tie it up from the last show and go from there. But I'll let Jorg explain what he's up to and. Uh, how you doing, man? How you doing today? I'm quite fine, Michael. Thank you. Good. Uh, I just uh, finished my dinner because over here it is already eight o'clock in the evening, and my mother made a fresh cooked Italian um, vegetable soup called minestrone. Ah, yeah. Oh, was good. delicious. <laughs> <laughs> and Sounds I ate good. a lot of it, and I ate a lot of it. So maybe I have to take a bathroom break in between. But I will tell you. Okay. <laughs> I will warn you if I have to leave for two minutes or so. That's fine, man. Yeah. yeah. Um, I prepared a little bit for um, the reading or, or, the, or the studying that we're going to do tonight. Um, we, last time, um, we were on this um, document, the Vatican and the Jesuits, as you probably remember. In the introduction, I read about um, the Vatican institutions, um, like uh, the military order of Malta, who control the United Nations, NATO, European Commission, the CFR, um, the central banks, big corporations, numerous secret societies and cults. And uh, we went through all that, and we went through the Masonic cities, you know, the connection between Vatican City of London, the square mile, or the crown, as it's also called, and of course the District of Columbia, which includes Washington, D.C., with its satanic street layout. And then we went on <clears throat> to read about different uh, political and judicial meddling uh, that comes with the Jesuits and uh, social perversions. And of course, then we ended at the military order of Malta operations, so the so called uh, Knights of Malta, or the, uh, the military order of Malta. Actually, it's called the SMOM. So when you ever see that written somewhere in, head, in, in capital letters, SMOM, that stands for the Supreme Military Order of Malta. And uh, <clears throat> what is the Knights of Malta organization mainly involved in? It is working for and with the black nobility, the Vatican, and the various papal and royal orders, especially the Jesuits, who are ultimately in control of the Vatican and the military order of Malta. This is something you cannot, um, you cannot leave out. This is really important to understand. When you read that someone who is in the United States government in any function, whether it is like in the past for example, I give you Dulles, that you know from, who was the CIA director in the 1960s. You had the Dulles brothers, you know, these two guys. Okay. And uh, Dulles, who was a, a knight of Malta, who was the, the head of the CIA. And that is the reason why JFK got killed, because JFK brought his brother in, and he wanted to take the control of the Vatican, of the CIA. He wanted it under his control, and that's why he killed. Why they killed him. Not because of his secret society speech, or because he printed a few dollars or whatever. It was because he touched someone who was untouchable. Uh, he touched the Knight of Malta, in the very high ranking, and he was not supposed to do that, and that's why he had to pay. Uh, of course, when you know that also, um, for example, uh, Fidel Castro, the president of Cuba, is uh, a Jesuit educated Knight of Malta, when you know why all the so called CIA attempts, uh, attempts to kill him. Uh, did not bear any fruit because they never really tried to do because he's untouchable. Mm -hmm. uh, military uh, uh, members of the military order of Malta, knights of the military order of Malta, are sometimes really, really very, very high position people within this whole organization, within this whole hierarchy of the so-called New World Order. And um, 
for example, Rupert Murdoch, who runs uh, the Fox Studios in the United States of America, the whole Fox News and Entertainment uh, Company, he is a Knight of Malta. So when you do not know who the Knights of Malta are, uh, this evening is a little bit dedicated to bring that closer to your attention, that you understand uh, what these people are, and uh, don't forget they are ultimately controlled by the Jesuits. So they are also just frontmen to do the acting for the Jesuits, because the Jesuits are also called, you probably heard that before, the hidden hand. Mm -hmm. They are always in the background. The hidden hand is always in the background. The hidden hand is the hand that uh, plays the chords where all the puppets dance to. Yep. Yeah. And they are in control because of their most and for all fear policy that they do. Second of all, because of their money policy that they do. Because when they want you to work for them and you agree, you are getting paid a shitload of money. You don't have to care for money for the rest of your world anymore, and you can be famous, and you can get all the stuff that you want, as long as you do what they say. But also with that, they have you in your hand. And because all these people are not in the Christian way of thinking, of knowing that everything in this world is just uh, materialistic and, and just just about money and sex, and I don't know what what else I can sum up, but it's not about their real life. These people are always fear for their life here. Yeah. Well, actually, when they uh, would be Christians and would accept Jesus Christ as the Savior, they wouldn't need to care for this life anymore because they knew there was something better waiting for them. Right. But, of course, in this way, these people are uh, always targets to get... Um, yeah, what's what's the word? Um, bought over. I mean, uh, uh, bribed. You know, you yeah, can get bribed and can can put under can put under under pressure uh, to do the things that they have to do. And even when they are in the order in the uh, order of the Knights of Malta, they still have to listen uh, uh, to their superiors, of course, but over the superiors. And so we are going to speak to a little bit later. But you really have to understand that the Supreme Military Order of Malta is the most powerful controlling inner core at the, uh, um, uh, and the inner core of that is the Order of the Garter, which you've probably heard of too, uh, whereas, yes. for example, Queen Elizabeth is uh, as Dame of Malta, also a member of the Order of the Garter, which is in turn controlled by the Pilgrim Society. So there are a lot of societies, secret societies, knighthoods, and all these things intertwined together, and uh, in the Commonwealth of Nations, headed by Elizabeth II, uh, um, it's made up of 53 nations spanning the globe, accounting for one-fifth of the land mass of the Earth and a very high percentage of its strategic resources and population. Though nominally an alliance of independent states, the Commonwealth was itself founded in the late 19th century as a perpetuation of the British Empire. And Queen Elizabeth II is heading that, and she is a member of the Order of the Garter and the Dame of Malta. So she also is under Jesuit control, even though, actually, Great Britain supposedly is a Protestant country still. Right? Right. <laughs> supposedly. So we can look a little bit into global business operations, for example, that are run by the military uh, Order of Malta. Central banks and their superstructure, the BIS, also known as the Bank for International Settlements, which was founded in 1930 in Switzerland with 55 central bank members. You know, the Bank of International Settlements is the bank of the banks. It is the mother of all central banks worldwide. All national central banks, like the Federal Reserve, like the German Bundesbank, like... Uh, um, the Swiss Bundesbank or whatever, all these central banks that the countries have, they are in an organization where the Bank for International Settlements is the mother bank. Mm -hmm. That is in Zurich in Switzerland, and the bank is owned by, you may guess, 
of the Vatican. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, but not directly. It's owned by the Rothschilds. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And of course, via the Rothschilds, it's owned by the Vatican. Okay. Yeah. Examples for these uh, central banks uh, I have here: uh, the Bank of England from 1694, the Banque de France, uh, that's the uh, Bank of France from 1716 and 1800, the U.S. Federal Reserve from 1913, the Vatican Bank from 1942. The Vatican Bank? Mm -hmm. Don't think that the Vatican Bank is under the rule of the Vatican. It's under the rule of the Jesuits. Eh? <laughs> Absolutely it is. Yeah. The Deutsche Bundesbank, and of course in Europe, the ECB, the European Central Bank that we have right now with this euro. And... Um, that is now for the moment, I think, uh, I don't know how many countries do we have the euro? 12, 13? I don't know. I don't follow that anymore. Anywhere where I go, I can pay with the euro. So the U.S. Federal Reserve ownership, if you are interested in reading that a little bit, who owns the Federal Reserve? M.M. M. Warburg and Co., that is an old uh, company from 1798, a banking company from 1798, coming from Germany, from Hamburg, where I come from. Mm -hmm. Chase Manhattan Bank, founded in 1799, from the U.S. Nelson Meyer Rothschild and Sons, founded 1811 in London. Lazar Brothers Bank, 1848, in the United States. Israel Moses Sieff, a bank from Italy. And Lehman Brothers, founded in 1850 by the United States, uh, in the United States of America, and Kuhn, also known as Kuhn and Loeb, from 1867, that is now part of Lehman Brothers, and of course Goldman Sachs, founded 1869. All these are the banks that own um, the Federal Reserve. And when you go into the Federal Reserve, that is a very, very interesting uh, subject, but that is. Uh, going to give us as we, we could go here tonight in there, but um, it is said, I, I think, um, by Eustace Mullins uh, somewhere, I read that, that the deposit that was made uh, by everybody for the founding of the Federal Reserve, only the, only the government of the United States of America deposited real gold, no, we have just gave paper. That's <laughs> <laughs> oh. figures. It wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me if that was true, but no. with Eustace Mullins also, you have to be very careful with it, uh, because I learned that he was a Jesuit coadjutor. He really? Yeah. I had never heard of that one before. I know yeah. he claimed, claimed to be a Christian, and I know that he exposed it, but, but then again, I guess if he wasn't exposing going all the way, I, it could be. <laughs> you know, you know, you're, now that you're saying that, there's a high probability. <laughs> Because he, he didn't spend much time talking about uh, the Jesuit connection and the uh, and the uh, Vatican connection, did he? Mm. Now, the little-known but extremely powerful bank for international settlements, also BIS, spent the 1930s and 1940s quietly laundering the Nazis' ill-gotten gains under a cloak of neutrality. So they was all the Nazi money they have there. What, 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 what are they doing? They, they are doing banks. Examples of Citibank, Bank of America. They are both Jesuit controlled. Yeah? Citibank and Bank of America. Okay. They do investment banking by real estate invest, uh, investment, uh, development, venture capital, hedge funds, security trading, secret banking, banking and offshore banking, insurance companies, global control funding organizations, for example, one the Rockefeller Foundation from 1913, founded by Pilgrim Society and Knight of Malta members John D. Rockefeller Sr., along with his son John D. Rockefeller Jr. and Sr.'s principal business and philanthropic advisor Frederick T. Gates in the New York State in 1913. Um, the Ford Foundation, the IMF, or International Mar Mil Monetary, <laughs> Monetary Fund, and the World, the World Bank Group. Uh, the World Bank came into formal existence on 27th of December 1945 following international ratification of the Bretton Woods Agreement, which emerged from the United Nations Monetary and Financial Conference from the 1st to the 22nd of July in 1944. Technically, the World Bank is part of the United Nations system. Yeah. 
And over the United Nations, we were speaking already last time when we went into Ellis Bailey and all the connections over there and what the UN start, stands for and what's it all connected to. And here you see again this interconnecting there, so it's, it's all connected. So what are the different World Bank connections, uh, divisions, uh, International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, it's one that you have. The International Finance Corporation, International Development Association, International Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes, 1966 founded. Multilateral Investment Guarantee Agency. See also the World Bank Institute, 1955, formerly named the Economic Development Institute, Independent Evaluation Group. Um, all this brings together organizations and individuals which support the establishment of a global federal system of strengthened and democratized Okay, democratized, yeah, okay. <laughs> Global institutions with plenary constitutional power accountable to the citizens of the world and the division of international authority among separate global agencies. Has had the special consultative status with the ECOSOC since 1970 and is affiliated with the UN Department of Public Information. So when you have a European investment bank, when you have the United Nations Capital Development Fund, um, you have the Asia Foundation, the United Nations Foundation, and you have Bill and Gates, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation from the year 2000 on. I guess that's something that you heard about, because the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is the largest transparently operating charitable between, uh, you know, we say that. It's the largest uh, publicly. Uh, Recognized charitable organization, so you're saying? Yeah, charitable by my meaning of yeah, charitable, what do you call charitable, you know? Uh, philanthropic. Um, yeah, they, I guess they donated how much? How many charitable billion? for the outside, but not for, for, but not for the inside. It seems for the outside charitable, but it is not. So you put, no, it, uh, you put it not in brackets, but between, you know, hyphens or whatever. Yeah. How did you call that? That's what I meant by it. Well, we, you look at their involvement with eugenics and the uh, vaccine program and everything. Absolutely. Else. Absolutely. You know, they're, they're turning out to be pretty shady characters. Who they're, they, company, they, they have company with us. Yeah, interesting, interesting is uh, what stands here is that um, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is controlled by three, three trustees. First of all, the Club of Rome member, Knight Commander of the Order of the British Empire, Bill Gates. <laughs> Bilderberg member, Kappa Alpha Theta fraternity member, Melinda Gates. And insurance billionaire, Warren Buffett. Several trilateral commission members also work for this charity project. Mm. Bill Gates in the Club of Rome and Knight Commander of the Order of the British Empire. <laughs> Seems to me quite high position. And then his wife, Bilderberg member, Kappa Alpha Theta fraternity member, Melinda Gates, and Warren Buffett. Now, I know that Bill Gates is not uh, the poorest man on earth. Warren Buffett isn't the poorest man on earth, but even these two combined together with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, then you can probably guess what they can achieve when they put all their money together, you know. Absolutely. It's for the so-called charitable Doles, where they have nothing charitable on, uh, expect, uh, except if you want to die because of vaccines and birth control and uh, all that stuff. So there are also not only bank bank uh, companies, but there are also, of course, uh, information corporations, media, software, IT, electronics, telecom. It's all. Um, under the control of the sovereign military order of Malta. Don't forget, that's what we are reading right now. Entertainment distractions, fear propaganda and mind control operations, informational uh, repression, perpetual copyright, idea monopolies with patents, DRM information, flow control, surveillance networks, and social tracking. Social tracking, well, surely today when you think of Facebook, Google+, Twitter, all these, uh, all these things, uh, all the companies behind that, they are all working for the same agenda and for the same people, and they are all controlled by the military order of Malta. Hmm. 
So, you know, for Bill, Bill Gates, do you know much about his early years? Uh, uh, was he like someone who was became a Knights of Malta? Was oh, was he born into that? Who? Oh. Bill Gates. Because, you know, they make this big old story up about him that he was like some little, nobody that built up this corp company. <laughs> yeah, that he worked in the garage and then yeah. and, uh, accident found all that stuff. Oh, yeah. Who believes? I mean, that, that the same idea is about when you when you look at this Mike Zuckerberg, the founder of Facebook. Yeah. Um, they made a movie on that. Yeah, they did. I waste my time watching it, too. Yeah, me too. Some some years ago, uh, I did that too. But then you understand. But then when you when you look deeper into that, then you understand that um, Facebook from the beginning was a CIA operation. Right, and then Bill Gates, and Mark, other and Mark Zuckerberg, and Mark Zuckerberg is just a person they put out there, and then let them take the earnings and let them take the credits, because they cannot say, "Oh, we at the CIA are doing this." And this is no. the same thing that going along with then. Bill Gates, right? And apparently, Bill Gates' father was CIA, um, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, it seems to stay in the family, doesn't it? Not for yeah, they, they they always work with chosen people. Can be sure about that. There's no uh, no one by accident coming really to the top, and like today. When you look at the IT market, uh, if there is a small company that is owned by some brilliant man who is not under control of anything and he has a very, very wonderful firm uh, company, then just Google comes up and says, I'm going to buy you. Uh, how much is it? And uh, any, everybody is uh, it's possible to be bought, you know? Yes. And then they get the control over this, you know? There is no independence in, in, in this. The only independence that we have is little broadcast like we do here, because we are not paid by anybody. We just use the Internet, but when they shut us down tomorrow, then we have to shut down also, because yeah, we don't have any other voice that we can uh, that we can offer to the people. We are dependent on their uh, hardware, let's say, or software, or whatever, to use that. But uh, we don't have the money to found our own radio station or whatever to do that. And if we did, uh, we would probably get in trouble because of the things that we say. Absolutely, all the regulations and the controls. Yep, this. Well, at least my country, there's no such thing as free, independent news. All you have is left is what we're doing right here. You know, mm -hmm. short wave, short wave, or having a little, you know, show like this. Insignificant show that 99.919 percent of people won't ever hear. So. <laughs> It's, it's the same over here in Belgium where I live, and it's certainly the same where, over in Germany where I come from originally. Um, because, you know, in Germany there are some secret contracts made, and um, after the Second World War, uh, the control of all media was given in, in Germany was given to the Allies until t 2099. That's by contract. Hmm. It's a secret contract that... No, no one should know, but <laughs> you can get the information out there on that. It's, it's called Geheimer Staatsvertrag. One more piece of the puzzle that justifies why you call Germany the 51st state, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. exactly. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I do that. Yeah. And Tom Fress, he likes to call the CIA, he, he, that stands for um, the Catholic in Action. Network, <laughs> you know, Catholics in action, CIA. So, and if you look at both those, we talked about. Um, uh, well, at least at least the Bill Gates and their associations with uh, Roman Catholicism. So, Knights of Malta, Roman Catholicism, and you can never negate the religious element in it. So. So the military order of Malta is further going into military corporations, uh, into energy and mining corporations for petroleum, for coal, for metals, for diamonds, for water. Think of water. There are 
privatizing the water all around the world right now, uh, making a natural source that is absolutely vital for survival private. <laughs> Um, they run several transportation corporations and shipping, automotive, aviation, airline, and railway, like, for example, uh, the big three, uh, GM, Ford, and Chrysler, is that, or, or what, uh, what are the three, big three in the United States? All, all run by Knights of Malta. So I know that the Ayacuca was a Knight of Malta. Uh, I searched that one way, so, you know, all these transportation corporations, all the big ones, uh, are, of course, in this scheme in there. Uh, Mercedes, uh, BMW, Volkswagen, uh, Porsche, we've got all the German companies in there, of course. And Opel, which is now General, uh, General, uh, General Motors, of course. Pharmaceutical corporations are all under their control, and food corporations. So, food corporations, there's something interesting. Probably you heard about the Svalbard Global Seed Vault. Did you? Yeah, you t is that the one you're talking about? It's, uh, it's in Iceland or Greenland? Yes, it's, it's, it's a vault that is up there in, uh, in Scandinavia somewhere. Okay, yeah, there you go, yeah. Where, this, where, where all the seeds, uh, all the original seeds of the world are, are, are taken care of uh, deep underground in the vault. Yeah. So... Um, Jesuit Georgetown University alumni, European Commission President Jose, uh, Jose Manuel Barroso. So he was, up to a few months ago, the European Commission President, and by that the man with the highest power in, in Europe, never elected, but selected in that, position, in that position. And he is Jesuit Georgetown University alumni. And Nobel uh, Peace Prize winner Vangari Matai of Kenya were among the dozens of guests who had uh, bundled uh, up for the ceremony inside the vault. Back into the permafrost of the mountain, it has been built to withstand an earthquake or a nuclear strike. The operation is funded by the Global Crop Diversity Trust, which was funded by the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization and Biodiversity International, a Rome-based research group. So, you know, they take all the original seeds in there, dug them deep in the ground, and then they poison up with GMOs. 10 to 21, right? Of course, because Monsanto has only one goal, and that is the food supply worldwide. And do that with uh, Monsanto, Syngenta, DuPont, mix the three companies, and you have worldwide control of the food chain. And when you control the food and the water and the money and the energy, well, where else to turn to, is it? No. It sounds, it sounds an awful lot like we're returning back to the feudal ages or the dark age, the feudal period of the Western absolutely, Europe. Absolutely, but that is, that is absolutely the way that we are on. Because in the time before the Reformation, the so-called dark ages, where the Pope had control over the then known world, and he was the one who crowned the kings. And without the pope, uh, the pope's authority, no king could ever reign or do, do anything. You only had two classes. You had the nobles, the people with money and standing, and you had the poor people, the peasants, and you had no middle class. All right. That is, that is what the Reformation gave us, and that is the big enemy of um, of Rome. And that's what they are trying to take away from us ever since. And of course, the new world order is actually nothing else than just the reinstatement of the old world order under new conditions, of course, because we are five, six hundred years later now. But the point is just as the Pope was the head of the world government in the dark ages, the Pope wants to be the same now in these ages. And that's the new world order. It's nothing else. And yeah. whether it's the Pope or it's someone else they, they put in front of you, it is behind the scenes the Pope or the black Pope that uh, pulls the strings. It's extremely tragic the more and more you think about it, you know. 
I know one thing, it just makes you more and more want to lean on uh, Jesus Christ and believe in him because there is no hope. And, and if, you, if we take what the Bible says seriously, this new round is going to be horrendous for mm-hmm. the whole world. But, you know, the most interesting thing is the further we go to read into this document, the further we see how deep all these connections are. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And how they are all intertwined, and that you see that this is really a web, like a spider's web, where once you get caught, and you have no way out of it anymore. Because wherever you turn to, wherever you turn to, you you you, you run into Big Brother. You know? Yep. I mean, it's it's like uh, with these various other corporations uh, that the sovereign military order of Malta controls. Um, and how do they control this? Well, at the annual meetings of the secretive Bilder- Bilderberg group. Have you ever heard of the Bilderbergers? Of course, yes. Yeah, they, were, they were founded in, uh, in my neighbor state here, the Netherlands, in Holland, the Netherlands, in a, in a hotel that was called, that was called uh, the Bilderberger Hotel. Uh, and that group was founded uh, by Knight of Malta, Joseph Rettinger, in 1954. And that is a geopolitically important business. Uh, there are geopolitically important business deals are made, and they meet every year at least once. One meeting is uh, always very, uh, yeah, uh, already put out in the media, not in the mainstream media, but uh, in the alternative media, it's very known. But the point is that this Bilderberg Group has. Uh, working cycles, working groups, a working group for this and a working group for that, and these groups come together uh, more than once in, in a year. So this Bilderberg meeting that we are talking about, it's only one meeting that's once a year where all these groups come together and all, all the same 200 people come in, but you have in the Bilderbergers, you have a core and a core group and, uh, of course, organizations where they are all in. And uh, who is coming to Bilderberg meetings? Well, people like... Uh, uh, the CEO of Google, um, the CEO of Apple, um, the CEO of um, big uh, insurance companies, banking companies, transportation companies like car builders, uh, uh, people from the politics, whether it's a minister or even a prime minister, may go into that secret meeting, although that I think in every country it is forbidden for everyone who is in the high position in government to uh, participate in the secret meeting, but they don't care, they go anyway. You know? Yeah. And, R- and Rattinger, if you look at him, uh, first of all, uh, even at the doors, does a really good video of that, of him in particular, and how it does a very persuasive, presents a very persuasive argument that Retten, Rettinger is one of the most, if not one, one of the most influential men of the last century. Is so few of us know who this man is, and it's interesting to look at his once again his Nazi connections and his Catholic connections. Mm-hmm. Knights of Malta, and he was Knight of Malta. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, where do the Knight of Malta? politically and judicial uh, meddling do. And the Order of Malta retains its claim of sovereignty under international law and has been granted permanent observer status at the United Nations. It issues its own passports, stamps, and coins. The Order of Malta has diplomatic relations with 100 countries and its sovereignty is recognized by 105 states. I think this is news that some people didn't know yet. How do they manage the global control structures via political structures, global and financial uh, structures that we've seen above? Also via the United Nations, 1919 to 1945, formerly called the League of Nations. You know, the the predecessor of the United Nations, of the League of Nations, where the United States um, didn't want to be a part of. And then they got them in 45 with... uh, the United Nations. Mm-hmm. The, Order, the Order of Malta has permanent missions to the United Nations and these specialized agencies. The UNESCO, which stands for Education, Science and Culture. The World Food Program, 
ISAD, which stands for Agriculture, the WHO, World Health Organization, Healthcare, and High Commissioner for Refugees, High Commissioner for Human Rights, and UNIDO, which stands for Industrial Development. It has permanent court arbitration since 1899 with the Carnegie Foundation. Uh, the Carnegie Foundation in 1903 donated one and a half million dollars for the construction, management, and maintenance of the Peace Palace. The Peace Palace was built to the House of Permanent Court and Arbitration and the Library of International Law. From 1922 on, the building also housed distinct and separate uh, Permanent Court of International Justice, which later became the International Court of Justice in 1945. So we have here Andrew Carnegie, who is from the Pilgrim Society, a member. You know, Pilgrim Society, big in control, yeah? and sometimes referred to as the second richest man in history. Carnegie Mellon University, 1900, Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and Water Pre uh, Waterloo Peace Prize Award since 1931 by the Carnegie Foundation. International Court of Justice, 1945. Uh, of course, we have them uh, in The Hague, the Academy of International Law, which is all controlled by the sovereign military order of Malta, the Socialist Fascist European Union, which is uh, its 1947 origins of the European movement founded by Knight of Malta, Joseph Rattinger, who we just talked about, who also founded the Bilderberg in 1954, and related institutions and projects. Um, they meddle also with... Um, the World Trade Organization, which was founded in 1944, the WTO. The Order of Malta is also a member of these international organizations, the International Committee of the Committee of the Red Cross from Geneva, International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, also from Geneva, 1919, International Committee of Military Medicine, International Institute of Unification of Private Law, Council of Europe and European Commission, and also European Council. Not one of us can read minutes of Committee of Permanent Representatives, the EU executive body comprised of unelected and mostly unknown national bureaucrats, known as permanent representatives, in contrast to elected ones, for God's sake. It pre cooks 90% of Brussels legislation and prepares the agenda for the EU's highest and most secret plenary body, the European Council. Because don't think that the European Parliament has anything to say. All the people who are sitting there in the European Parliament are just paid puppets. They don't have anything to say. The laws are made with the European Commission. And by that, Manuel Barroso, which I talked earlier about, who was uh, until a few months the, um, the head of the European Commission, was the most powerful person in Europe because he, he made his laws and nobody elected him. You know, Nobody elected him. He was selected by the European Council. The European Council it will come together from all the heads of state of the, of the countries who are in the European Union. And they elect or select some people for this commission, for this powerful <coughs> for this powerful position. Under the Lisbon Treaty, the European Council would become a formal institution with the power of appointing the commission. It could be said that the two bodies, the European Commission and the European Council, hold the effective power of the Union. Yeah. And nothing to do with the European Parliament. There is absolutely nothing to say about that. Um Probably something that my European friends are more aware of than you is Echelon. Have you heard of that? I've heard of it. Yeah. But I don't know much about it, to be honest with you, but I, I have heard of it. Echelon, uh, Echelon is uh, a global unified intelligence service, in, including Echelon. So they, they are the NATO of Malta managing the global unified intelligence service including Echelon, and the specific secret services to defend and promote the Vatican Jesuit Masonic interests. This unified international intelligence community was built during Rome's uh, Second Thirty Years' War, 1914 to 1945, 
and perfected during Zom's subsequent Cold War between 1945 and 1990. Um, Echelon is... Uh, well, everybody speaks now about the NSA and the so-called scandal that is coming out, that the NSA is controlling everybody and reading everybody's emails and listening to everybody's telephones and all that stuff. That's already since the 90s here in Europe with its project Echelon. I think that is uh, based for a big part in Great Britain. Um, that, is, that is here already normal since, since all these years. I mean, the lay people don't know that because they don't care for that, but they don't care for anything but their cheeseburgers and football on TV. But um, everybody who is a little bit into research and that knows Echelon here in Europe, and that is already much longer than this NSA scam that's now coming up. And of course, next to this uh, unified intelligence service, uh, what, what do you have to understand on the unified intelligence service? It's very easy. You take from every country the secret service they have, like in the United States, you have the CIA, you have the NSA, you have the FBI, um, probably a few more that I'm not aware about right now. But all these are intelligence uh agencies. And then you have in Israel the Mossad, and in Germany you have the BND, and in, uh, in Russia you have, um, well, you have this uh, KGB, which is now, I don't know, FCB or what it is called right now. It changes the name, but it's still the same organization. All these intelligence companies are in fact under one cap that is controlled by the Supreme Military Order of Malta, which is again controlled by the Jesuits. So you can say that the Jesuits, or in other words, the Roman Catholic Church, has all the needed intelligence information worldwide because they own or control all intelligence agencies worldwide. That's why it's such a joke like in German they are playing this theater for the people with this you know Angela Merkel the Chancellor, her telephone was tapped by the NSA. And they make such a big scandal out of it. And did the MAD know? You know, MAD is Militärische Abschirmdienst, that is um, the military intelligence uh, agency in, in Germany. Did the, the MAD know, or did the BND know, uh, Bundesnachrichtendienst, which is uh, the CIA in Germany? Uh, did they know and why didn't they do anything and they play a big theater there already for half a year with, the, with this with this hacked phone by, by Angela Merkel <laughs> where, where, where so-called one uh, intelligence agency is working against another or spying in another dude they are all interchangeable they are all out there with the same agenda maybe not on the outside for everybody to see but behind the scenes behind the scenes, and this is why it is so important that we have to put in our minds, okay, it is the military order from the Knights of Malta, but the Knights of Malta are Jesuits and are, are Jesuit controlled. Right. And then you have just to go, really, you have to go into the oath that the Jesuits take to understand this. I always get sick when I get a comment on one of my videos where they say, well, you know, it's crypto Jews who founded the Jesuits. Oh my God, how is that possible? But <laughs> you have to be, you have to, uh, people are so dumb, but, but you have to be aware of the point that even in their own oaths, they state, and even to descend so low as to become a Jew among Jews, that you might be enabled to gather to, uh, together all information for the benefit of your order as a faithful soldier of the Pope. Yep. 
that is taken directly, directly from the oaths from the Jesuits. Right. And when you are aware of this, then you have a chance to see through that curtain that they throw in front of your face to blind you. And not only that, the Jesuit oath, but it's also part of the Knights of Malta oath and the Knights of Columbus oath. Yeah, that's that's right. They are all the, the the same thing. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. You know, we talk about what a crypto Jew is. I finally have kind of figured out what it really means, uh, and it really means is you know you can be as a Jesuit, you can be a Roman Catholic Buddhist, a Roman Catholic Jew, a Roman Catholic Mormon, and so when we talk about crypto Jews, we're really talking about basically. People whose first affiliation is with Roman Catholicism who are pretending to be or posing as or participating in the Jewish faith or the Mormon faith or the Buddhist faith, it doesn't really matter. So when we talk about that, you know, people make a huge mistake of, of, because they hear Jew, they think automatically that that's their first allegiance is to the Jewish faith. But no, crypto-Jew means... They are first and foremost in line with Rome. I Just know, like a, I understand. Crypt, crypto Mormons. I mean, if you look at the leadership of the Mormon Church, which is deviating a little bit from your topic, but this point, good point. I think I think there is one thing that people do not understand, but they have to make a distinction between a Jew is not a Jew. No, not at all. You have you have the so-called Jewish religion. I say so-called because that religion is not Jewish. That religion was in the Old Testament Israelic. And Judah was just one of the 12 tribes. So you have the religion the Jews follow. On the other hand, you have the race of the Jews from the tribe of Judah. The descendants of the old tribe of Judah, like we have descendants of the old tribe of Benjamin and of Naphtali and uh, all the other twelve in together. So you have Jews by blood and you have Jews by belief. You know, I found it always very funny when you watch some Hollywood movie and uh, then someone has to convert to the Jewish belief because they want to go marry. And I say, so his blood changes now or what? <laughs> You can become a Jew. You cannot become a Jew. Whether you're a Jew, that's genetic, that's your race, you are from that tribe, or you are not. You can assume the belief. Yeah, okay, I can become a Hindu, but I will not become an Indian, you know? Right. My DNA is not changing. I'm not getting brown from, from, from tomorrow on just because I'm saying I'm a Hindu now. So, and that distinction makes it so, makes it so hard. So who is now a Jew who should be, like, let's call it protected or whatever? The Jew who is a Jew by blood or the Jew who is a Jew by confession? Yeah. And there is not this distinction made in the outside world. And that is why, for example, APAC, this American-Israeli um, propaganda agency, community, how I call it, <laughs> APEC, right. is such a heavy, heavy organization with such a heavy influence in the United States of America. Because uh, the most Jews who are running that are just Jews by what they say, belief, you know, by conversion. Uh, other people speak then of the Khazars. Um and Ashkenazi, and all that stuff. I don't want to go into that because there's too much disinformation on that subject to go into that uh, Khazar and then uh, Nazi stuff and Ashkenazi stuff. But you have to understand that um, a lot of Jews who are put out there are just Jews by accepting that belief system. It has nothing to do with, the, uh, with being descendants from the original tribe of Judah where that actually came from. I think yeah. that's something for our listeners also to, to, to consider. Uh, a little bit. 
Yeah. And then, then if you deal with biblically that, you know, the 70 weeks of Daniel and then the end of the Jewish era, you know, at the stoning of Stephen and it just goes on and on and on. You know, the, the fact of the matter is it's just been used as a, a, a scapegoat by the mm-hmm. Jesuits and by Rome to vet everyone's racist tendencies and anger at somebody. And, of course, you know, let's we'll send it towards the Jews instead of the actual true culprits or what's going on, which is always oh, Rome. It's always Rome. And it's you know, the Jesuit order and its machinations. So. But that's what it does. It always uses these front groups to hide what it's doing. So, yeah. So. For most folks, they, they, because we're, we're, we're inherently lazy, and then on top of that, being taught to be lazy, you know, we don't go very much deeper in uh, finding out the truth about, you know, who are the Jews, what's the role in all of everything in the world, you know. But at some point, you have to realize, you, you would come to this realization, there's no way that the Jews could have enough power to do what, is being done in this world. There has to be an organization that and that organization, as you learn, it, it turns out to be wrong. Because only when they're wealthy enough, powerful enough to actually do the, the things that need to be done in this world in order to have a one world government. So. Yeah, but for the moment, we are living in the time of the Gentiles. And when you understand that, then you always know that there cannot be a Jew on the top of something, you know? Mm-hmm. True, but what these organizations like the Jesuits do, and what they love to do, is put out someone to take the blame for them. Yeah. So when they make it seem to people who do research and that stuff like we do, but, but they don't do it so deep like we did, okay? But, but most of the people who do this research and who hang on Alex Jones and Texan Mars and David Icke and all these people. And when the Jesuits succeed in putting in front of all these truth-hungering people, Jews, as the culprits, as the culprits, they initiate hate. <coughs> Sorry. Sorry. They initiate hatred. And they initiate anti Semitism. Even the subject of anti Semitism, sorry, is really another subject than just the subject about the Jews, because even the Jews are not Semites. Right. But, but that's something else. But let's just talk in terms of how the people who are living in the Matrix understand this topic. And they are being set up to blame the Jews. That is exactly what Hitler used in the 1930s when he was speaking about um, the Jewish banking empire and all that stuff. But uh, I, I just read it. Who owns the Federal Reserve? Who owns all these banks? The Knights of Malta. The Knights of Malta are not Jewish. And the Jesuits behind them are not Jewish. But that's who runs it. We are living in the times of the Gentiles and not in the times of the Jews. But that doesn't mean that the Jews are there to take the blame because they are put out there to take the blame. Yep. And they do that already since hundreds of years and they do it very successfully. And of course, the Jews who are selling themselves out for this are responsible to what is done to their fellow brethren. If you ask me who is responsible for the Holocaust, which is not a subject that I will go into, but that's most of all the Rothschilds. Yeah. Because they let it happen. They are controlled by the Knights of Malta. They are even themselves knights of Malta and other knighthoods but they are controlled by the Jesuits and they are with their family there, they let it happen the, 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 the history of the, of the Rothschilds is, is very interesting and um, I've seen something in the text that I'm reading 
whether it's this text that I have right now or the one that we are going to read later on, uh, when we come into uh, when we come into the founding of uh, of, of the Rothschilds in that time. All right. So the other thing is too, when we look at World War II, when we look at the, the uh, late twenties, early thirties, Rome. When we talk about Roman Jews, crypto Jews. What Rome did is they sent an, a bunch of what quote unquote crypto Jews into Germany with money, and bought up all this depressed uh, land, even this land that lost all its value yeah, at, at, at cheap. And use them as a once again as a scapegoat, and then you know made this whole story a scenario that is the Jews are the one that are ruining Germany. The Jews are running the you know the economy. When in truth, if you look at the history, the historical facts about it, Rome it actually gave these Jewish crypto Jews uh, financial support and aid to actually do that. And then they turned it around and then used that as a way to, um, you know, instead of having the, the focus, once again, because this is what the Jesuits do, instead of having the focus on them, they always have it on the scapegoat, a group, somebody, you know, that, that the rest of the world sees, but never the Jesuits. So they use the Jews as an excuse. And the Rothschilds were a big part of that whole scenario. Absolutely. Um, you know, and not only the Rothschilds, but also Warburg, which is also a Jewish uh, company, and Kuhn and Loeb, which is also a Jewish company, but, but formerly coming from Germany, with this banking house there, that are also partakers of the Federal Reserve. That I was reading. Right. Uh, I, I'd like to I'd like to continue in my text. We were yes. speaking about uh, the sovereign military order of Malta managing the global unified intelligence services and what includes all that. So understand that all intelligence agencies all around the world are gathered together under a so-called Unified Intelligence Service, and that is run by the Knights of Malta. And, of course, all the military structures like NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, uh, United Nations troops, and Blackwater Private Military, Blackwater, which is, I think, today called EX, and uh, which is just um, mercenaries, people who get hired and paid to to go out for war, to go out for terrorist attacks and all that stuff. Uh, that is where all these people come from when you hear that somebody uh, put a car bomb here or, or, or blow himself up or blew himself up. This is all in, in working together uh, with uh, NATO and, and NATO secrets, um, NATO secret organizations like you had that here in Europe, Gladio. You heard about that? Gladio? Gladio, I've, I've heard of it. Once again, another topic that I, I've not really done yeah. much research. Uh, this, is, um, this is some like uh, the fifth column uh, or, or, or structures of NATO left behind uh, to um, to fight back if so-called uh, if the so-called Russians uh, got us here so that they were the last base off. And uh, Gladio was uh connected into crimes and everything else like here in belgium where i was there was uh, some 20 30 years ago there was this colroyd gang uh Colroyd is a big supermarket and then and, and these uh, supermarkets were all um robbed and there was gladio behind that um there's a very interesting researcher from switzerland his name is dr daniele ganza and you can look him up. He does uh, very interesting lectures, also in English, about Gladio, and uh, tells, tells that out. So Gladio is more like, uh, let us call, the terrorist department of NATO. And, of course, you have the same in Blackwater or EX, whatever, where you work with mercenaries. Uh, don't forget uh, the French Foreign uh, foreign Legion, it's called. Uh, yep. Yeah. Um, they are also used for, for, for these tactics, for terrorism and all that stuff to put in there. So, all that under the control of the Knights of Malta. And um, what policy propaganda for the purpose of social, commercial and military control do we have that is also controlled by the Knights of Malta? Uh, international policies, you have the Chatham House that is uh, founded in 1920, EU-based, formerly called the Royal Institute of International Affairs or RIIA, 
this is, uh, maybe you've heard of that before. But Chatham House is interconnected also with the Club of Rome. Then you have the International Institute for Strategic Studies, which is 1958 uh, founded and EU-based. Then you have, of course, the Club of Rome. Uh, you have the Trilateral Commission, which was founded in 1973. You have the special international policies like the Tavistock Institute, um, which is for social psychology politics, Aspen Institute, US-based, mm -hmm. Senlis Council, 2002, EU-based drug policy institute with offices in Afghanistan, Kabul, Kandahar, and Lashkar Gah. Aha, uh -huh. Drug Policy Institute in Afghanistan. Aha, uh -huh. okay. <laughs> Where you know, before the United States of America invaded, uh, the crops went down, and uh, the opium production is on an all-time high since the Americans have been there. Yep. So who is running the drugs? Normal people or the government? Uh, then you have also... Transatlantic, the, Euro, uh, the Economic Council from 2007, which is under their control, and national policies. You have Brookings Institution. You have the Council on Foreign Relations, and you see that directly when you go on their website with the Pegasus that they have, this flying horse. The American Enterprise Institute, the John Birch Society, Cato Institute, the Council on National Policy. And John Birch Society is controlled by the Sovereign Military Order of Malta. Who is a famous member of the United States of America of the John Birch Society? Ron Paul. Yep. So, where is his allegiance to? Huh? Rome. <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> you don't get any points for that answer, Michael. I know. It's too easy. <laughs> I know. I just, I just try to get, you know, my journey, it just becomes so, uh, the, the overwhelming evidence that, Rome's involvement in our day-to-day -day lives and what's going on, uh, internet, geopolitics, it just, it just becomes a point just like, that's the answer. The default answer to everything is Rome, Rome, <laughs> The Jesuits in Rome, because it's the truth, and it's just really, it's very, I understand why a lot of folks will go, well, can you guys talk about something else? The problem is it all goes, if we're going to have an honest discussion, it still goes back to Rome. Yeah, you know, everybody knows that saying, all roads lead to Rome. But never anybody is really thinking about what they just said. No, it's just a cliche from the past, it's right? just a cliche, yeah. And do you know where that comes from? The cliche? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Shoot, I because Rome, Rome was the first real society that we had here in Europe that was really much progress, right? And expanded by wars and everything, and they had to build roads for their troops. And because they came from Rome, where they started all the wars to, whether it was into France, into Germany, into I don't know, where, Spain, wherever, mm. all the roads came from Rome. Of course, all the roads lead to Rome. <laughs> because they were built from there. That was the starting point. Not many people are aware of that. But that's the truth. It, it's also like uh, we have this uh, some, some, some ways are still today called Roman roads here in, 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 in Belgium and Germany. We have that still. Right. They really go back 1,000, 1,500, 2,000 years to, to the original road that was built then. That road is already there that long. Can you believe that? We have roads here 2,000 years old. Yeah. I mean, I, mean, I saw that in Portugal and, and in, in parts of England, too. So, yeah, I'm, I believe that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's amazing how, yeah, I mean, the, the, it was a... The architectural wonder is, you know, at its heyday of Rome, that was basically the pagan Rome that we're talking about prior to the Holy Roman Empire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With its aqueducts, its plumbing, its its highway systems. Uh, you have to you have to understand that Rome was a city inhabited by more than a hundred thousand people, and uh, they were living there in that conditions. They they had all to get fresh water 
access at least, and then they all had to go to the toilet. Yeah, it all had to be taken care of. So, yeah, that's where it goes back. But nobody ever thinks about when they say all roads lead to Rome. They never think about where does that come from and why is that? And not only why is that, but really that absolutely every road they walk on leads to Rome also today. And therefore, it is very interesting to see how they package that and how they want to um, take that out of the site. And that is by creating benign charity funds. Yeah. That's what the military order of Malta do. Just like the Catholic Church and the Jesuits like to do, to try and confuse people about their fascistic history and their present operations. Sometimes these seemingly harmless charity organizations are also used for information gathering and espionage in foreign countries. I'll give you some examples. We have the Rotary International. Over 32,000 clubs in 200 countries. See also their support for the UN globalist agenda. The Rotarians are a bit like Boy Scouts, grown old and successful. The celebrated writer ignored, no doubt, um, to what extent he was correct, at least regarding the common origin of the two groups. So Rotary International and the Rotarians. That's really something very in, it's interesting to go into. Father Esposito actually recalled Rotary's Masonic spirit with these enlightened words. <clears throat> Quote, the existing report between this organization and masonry is essential, not only because of its founding on February 23, 1905, by the lawyer Paul P. Harris of Chicago, along with three of his fellow masons, but also because of the ideological and judicial elements borrowed from masonry, which take the best in the initiatory message in order to insert it into the society and laicize it, that is by excluding the initiatory and restrictive aspects, which by always excluding religious confessionalism, have a certain sacred, although lay, character. Hmm. Interesting, huh? It is. 32,000 Rotary Clubs in 200 countries. That means they are everywhere. Yeah, it is. Absolutely it's... everywhere. And you know what they seem to be for the outside, like this benign charity front, that's, that's why it's called that way in the article here. For the outside, they seem to be good, but for the initiate and the higher levels, they know the real agenda. But there you have again the problem of esoteric and exoteric knowledge that has been taught. Hmm? Yeah. And then you also have Malteser International, which was founded in 1953 as Malteser Germany, renamed in 2005, operating in 30 countries in Africa, Asia, Europe, and the Americas. Malteser Organization, yeah. I know that from, from Germany already. <coughs> Okay, I'm going to read a little bit about uh, Catholicism and the Holy Roman Empire. How is that connected to the Jesuits? Hmm? Sounds good. Hey, this way, yeah. you know, I am listening. I'm going to have to mute myself out for a little bit as some for the people just showed up at the house. But we have a couple people listening as well. So I'll have my headset on. I will be listening, but I won't be able to respond for about five minutes. So Okay, okay. that's all right. I'm just going on by myself. <laughs> all right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. While the militaristic Roman Empire was collapsing, Pope Simancus uh, created the Vatican Palace in 514 as the seat of the universal religion called Catholicism. Universal religion, Catholicism, well, Catholic Catholicism means universal. We have to understand that. Catholicism itself was created about 150 years before by Emperor Constantine. The first, using the first Council of Nicaea in 325 to control the political and spiritual uprisings among various regions, tribes, and slave groups, thereby making Constantine the first, the first in a long series of Roman emperors or popes who explicitly wanted to completely rule over both the spiritual and political realm. Perhaps indicative of the lack of interest of the First Council of Nicaea and the Roman agenda was that of the 1900 invites sent to religious leaders, only about 300 participated. Well, that was not very interesting then, that 1500 people uh, don't show up to the invitation. 
early Christianity-like cultures were spreading and imposing a very large threat to the Roman Empire. So the Romans institutionalized the various Christian-like cultures into a new universal religion named Catholicism. Many people still see the papacy as only a religious organization. But if one looks into their never-ending quest for the political power, you'll see that the Roman Empire and the papacy have always had the exact same goal, world domination. The differences are only in the execution of this neurotic idea. The most powerful tool of the Vatican organizations has been to take hostage the much older Judaic Christian-like cultures and force these cultures into a superficial look-alike called Catholicism, or as Roman Catholics like to say, Christendom. In many parts of the world, native people were first massively killed if their spiritual leaders could not be corrupted. Then the rest of the tribe was slowly converted into the cult of Catholicism by missionaries, using the lie that the supreme spirit they worshipped was actually the same as the one in the Roman Catholic Church. The Vatican never was a true Christian culture-based organization. It has always been an occult, esoteric or hidden, bloodthirsty political organization which has built a deceiving, hypocritical font of religious dogma, what I was speaking about, the exoteric or the visible, derived from the ancient mystic, uh, mysticism religions, sun worship, human and animal sacrifices, holy priests and strict obedience to structures. For more than 2,000 years, all authentic Judaic Christianity-like cultures have been persecuted and often annihilated or at least severely weakened by the Vatican. Yeah, we were just talking about Constantine and 325, the Council of Nicaea. You can also name 321, where he changed uh, the Sabbath from the biblical Sabbath, uh, Sabbath, Sabbath day, Saturday into the first day of the week, Sunday. And that was also Constantine, and that's why he is uh, actually, you can call it the founder of Roman Catholicism. He was the one who melted Christianity from the followers of Jesus Christ, from these churches that were apostates of pagan Rome, of course. He melted that together with his um, pagan rituals and that mixture he called Christendom or Roman Catholicism, if you want to. Oh, there's so much stuff to talk about when we go into in, into these parts. Uh, so very interesting. I'm just going to read on a little bit more from the history that is written down here. So, by 541, with the Council of Chalcedon, uh, the Holy Roman Empire itself had already fractured somewhat, and uh, with the official East-West schism in, 15, uh, in 1054, the Orthodox Church split from the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, why did they split from the Holy Roman Empire? Because they didn't accept the Pope as Vicar of Christ, as the God on Earth. They didn't accept their hierarchy. That's why they split up in 1054. However, the Holy Roman Empire was becoming more and more dominant in Europe and reached its power peak in the 13th and 14th century. Well, that were the absolute dark ages in that time. After the Renaissance, the struggle for religious and political freedom of the various Reformation movements during the Middle Ages and up to the 18th century, some lost terrain had been regained by the Protestant nations, but the losses have been enormous, and much of the authentical spiritual basis of Christianity-like cultures has been erased from the collective memory. Almost none of the numerous Christian splinter churches today acknowledges, let alone communicates, this ancient legacy of Roman Catholic persecution, history, falsification, and spiritual conversions. Sadly, most of the so-called Christian churches today, however, are still connected to Catholicism, and thereby also the Vatican organization, in various ways, or have been infiltrated and co-opted, mainly by the Jesuits, in many cases. The Vatican institution and its mafia network have always been a fascistic political organization with the cover of religious organization. The aim is and was population control, the spiritual and political realm by, many, by any means. These two realms of domination, the spiritual and temporal, are represented by two crossed keys on the papal tiara 
which can be seen in many Catholic churches and on the flag of the Vatican. Because the Pope holds the two keys of the spiritual and the temporal power. And this is exactly when you read Daniel, the prophecies of Daniel in the Old Testament, we understand that the fourth beast is different from all the other beasts. I mean, not, not the first beast, but the, the, the little horn. The little horn that comes out of the ten toes where the toes are mixed, uh, the, the, the toes and the, and the feet of iron are mixed with miry clay. You know, the toes and the feet of iron stand for the state power. And the miry clay stands for the spiritual. And as iron and clay do not mix, um, so that, that system won't work. But that is what makes this last beast different from all the others in Daniel. And that is the combination of church and state. When you go into old Egypt, when you go into old Babylon, when you go into Medo-Persia, when you go into Greek, and even when you go into the pagan Roman Empire, there had always been a division between religious and civil power. And that is what the Roman Catholic Church under Constantine did in the 320s, 330s and the years to come until the papacy reached its full, its full power in 538 after having killed uh, three big uh, people in Europe like the Ostrogoths, the Vandals and uh, there was a third one. Those were the three horns that had to be plucked out when you read the Bible. And after that, the Vatican got full power, so they had about 200 years to melt the spiritual power with the temporal or the civil power. And that's where this last beast differs from all the other beasts before him, because here you have the combination of church and state. And of course, when you understand a little bit of... Um, of the Bible and all that stuff, and you know that God never wanted to have a link of church and state together. That is uh, absolutely unbiblical. <clears throat> and that is what, what I just read, that it all comes together in this, when, when you look a little bit into this one world religion, you can say, okay, how, I don't know, how are they going to do a one world religion? We have Islam, we have Christianity, we have Hinduism, we have all that stuff. Well, I made, a few, uh, I made a few videos on my channel, Jogla 66, um, that you can uh, have a look at. And um, they are called uh, One World Religion. The wound, is almost, uh, the wound is healing. I made two videos on that. And in the second video of that, there is an article about a house of worship that is going to be built in Berlin, Germany where there is worship for three different religious groups, namely Christianity, uh, Jews, and uh, Islam. These three on the one roof can go there, hold their prayers, and there's uh, a center in it, where can all, when all these three can come together and worship together. That's how they try to melt these religions. And you also have Rick Warren, who in the United States of America promotes since a long time already, Chrislam, which is the fusion of Christianity and Islam. Now, when you think about it, it's not so strange because the Vatican founded Islam. And when you study it, Islam is nothing else than Roman Catholicism for Arabs. 
Well, if that is so, then you can also merge these two together, you know? And that eventually, I think, is uh, one of the plans that they have. But that's the way they go for a one-world religion. And there's only one thing that came in between there, and that was the Reformation, and um, how the Reformation changed the Vatican control it had. Because you have to understand, until um, the Reformation really took foot in the 1520s, uh, before there, there was only uh, there was only Vatican control. There was nothing else. But I'm going to read a little bit about Reformation and Vatican control right now. The Reformation changes since the early 16th century by the Protestants, which is actually what the Vatican called the sovereign heretics. So the political systems such as more decentralized ruling tax income, less centralism from Rome, and the millennium of battles against the oppressive Roman Empire that went before that sets the stage of an ongoing struggle by people all over the world to be able to live according to our natural birthright. Sovereignty of the body and spirit of each individual, protecting our sovereignty from state, religious, corporate, and secret society fascism is our principal collective responsibility. This shared value should be basis for our constitutional law all other constitutional laws should be derived from this basis. The true history of the Reformation and the opposing counter-reformation, starting with the Ecumenical Council of Trent in 1545, however, was and still is not a simple two-sided conflict between the Holy Roman Empire and the sovereign people and their nations. There is growing evidence showing that the Lutheran Reformation movement was secretly used by the Rosicrucians, and later the Jesuits, behind the scenes, to, first, restrict the social-political effects of the Reformation on societies in Europe, and second, diminish to the established power structures of the papacy so that these secret societies could infiltrate and, over time, completely take over the Vatican institution, partly from the inside and partly from the outside. They succeeded in doing this, but not without visible historic friction. Well, there's something that I want to go a little bit deeper into this, and this is um, about the Reformation. When it's stated here, there's growing evidence showing that the Lutheran Reformation movement was secretly used by the Rosicrucians and later the Jesuits behind the scenes. I, I haven't done a deep study in that, but I came across, when I studied Martin Luther, I came across the... Uh, um, uh, the point that someone mentioned that Luther was a Rosicrucian. I, I don't know that. I cannot confirm that. I cannot deny that. I don't know that. I just put it out there and say there is information out there that states that Luther was a Rosicrucian. Well, let's just say that Luther was one of the most influential reformers ever. I don't want to play down the role of Wycliffe and Tyndale and Knox and Huss and Kramer and all these other great, great people before the eye of God who gave their life for what they believed in and they were all doing the reformers' work. But worldwide, when you, even in the English-spoken nations, when you speak about the Reformation, people come on with Luther. So let's say that he was the big Reformation figure. He had a lot of influence. I never understood, and maybe some of our listeners can give an idea to help me understand that. Luther came out of the Roman Catholic Church. And his idea was to reform the church. Now, a few points on that. Luther, like all the other reformers, identified the Roman papal system and the Pope in person as the Antichrist, as the biblical 
historical and prophetic antichrist. He did that. The other reformers did that. There's no question about that. That's why Roman Catholicism calls them heretics and wants them to kill. That's why they invented this futurism idea in 1590 by Al- Kazar, I think, was his name, and uh, Ribera was the other. That's why they did that. But how can you reform the Church of Satan? Are you going to convert Satan to accept God as an authority again? This is something where the reformers were wrong. You have to understand there is a difference between, for example, a revolution and a rebellion. And the Reformation was a revolution where it should have been a rebellion. The difference is when you are in a revolution and you take anybody out who has anything to say with in power and you are going through all the powerful structures and the hierarchy and you put everybody aside and you, you replace that with new people but you keep the old structure that's a revolution a rebellion is when you tear it all down you smash it all to the ground done. And you will start from grassroots, from the start, you will start a new hierarchy that is based on the beliefs that you have. That's kind of what God did with the people of Israel. They were not organized. They were slaves in Egypt. He took them out there Eventually, he gave them their own country, but he also gave them the rules they should live on. And whether they believed and obeyed the rules, or God was taking his protection away. Right? So, Israel in that time was a rebellion because they started their own thing. They didn't use any old structures. But when they came into the promised land, and they didn't kill all the heretics, let's say, there, all the pagan sun worshippers, Baal worshippers, Mithra worshippers, 666 sun worshippers all around, generally, but they let them live and they took over their traditions they got infiltrated by that and they fell away from God by the time. So read the Old Testament for yourself. I don't have to explain all that, but that's exactly what happened. Uh, God said it himself. You are a stubborn people. He didn't use the word stubborn. He used another word, but it's uh, coming around that. Uh, I think stiff-necked was, was the word in the Bible. <laughs> My mistake. You always want to do your own thing, do you? So, when, when we go back to the Reformation here, you have to see that when all the Reformers identify the papal system with the Antichrist, how in God's name can they think to reform that? No, it cannot be reformed. It has to be overthrown. And my second point in there is, why didn't Luther push on the Sabbath? He also kept Sunday. Where do all the Protestant Sunday schools come from? Tell me, please, where you send your children to when you want to have two or three hours with your own or with your partner on Sunday. Oh, send the kid to Sunday school. Yeah, really? Sunday school? Why? Wasn't the day of worshipping in the Bible 
wasn't that the Sabbath day? Wasn't that wasn't that the seventh day of the week? Wasn't that the Sabbath, the Saturday? Why didn't Luther and no one of the other reformers also? But Luther was the one with this big impact at that time. I mean, Tinder, okay, he was he was a great man, but he was more, more, more working on the on the on, on the writing on, on just uh, translating the Bible into the common word of the people using the Hebrew and the, and the Greek text, which is fantastic. But he did like Erasmus also, uh, who who first um, uh, covered I think um, the uh, uh, translation from the Greek New Testament into in, into uh, into Latin. Uh, and later on some something else, but that's not the point. But they were more, let's say, they were more working on the software. Luther was working on the hardware. Luther was out there praying to the people and, 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 and giving sermons to the people and, and uh, telling the farmers what rights they had and, and finding uh, founding a a middle class by 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 this. Uh, free conscious that was given to us and that we are that we were made aware of and that once we were not bound under the yoke of Rome anymore we could really use so he was really pushing this and to me he is responsible for that and why in, in God's name why didn't he push the Sabbath question that is my big question of Martin Luther I don't know Michael are you back maybe you want to answer on that yeah, I'm back. Um, that's a darn good question. It's I wish I had the answer. Um, you know, obviously you're not the first one to ask that question. Uh, most of us would get to this point and ask this question, you know, why did they not go all the way? Uh, the argument about um, reforming Satan's church is it, it's an impossibility. It's a contradiction. I mean, there's only one way to go about it, you know. The ultimate struggle with all this is who we're, who's going to be our master? Is it going to be Rome, or is it going to be Christ, Jesus Christ? And if it's Jesus Christ, then you're going to come to you're going to face this issue. It's interesting with me and um, Tom Press and and uh, and Walt Stickle were having a conversation about this last night, you know. And uh, I know at, at least Tom, myself, and you, and others, and I, I, think, I believe Walt as well, if, asked this question: Why didn't they not go all the way with it? Why didn't they not, uh, you know, go back to teaching the Ten Commandments? And uh, you know that you know one of the answers might be. Just what you're bringing up, but you know his connections to the Rosicrucians. How much did uh, how much did uh, Martin Luther really want to break away from the church, or did he just really just wanted to, re- as it's called, reform it? And um, why weren't they not brave enough to to do that? Um, you know, I. I First of all, I'm not, the questions we're raising, I don't kind of find them as condemnations on Mark Luther or other reformers. It's just a, at this point, it's asking the questions why. Why didn't it not happen? And until we get those answers, we really don't have a right to condemn them too much because um, we don't know what their circumstances were and how horrendous it was under those circumstances and how challenging it was. So, yeah, I, I wish I had an answer to that. And if you do find the answer, please pass it on to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, Michael, I'm sure that I will never can give you the answer because um, today sometimes it's easy to spot a Jesuit coadjutor um, or somebody who's just putting out there to take the blame for others like Edward Snowden, Julian Assange, all these people are placed there, you know. Mm-hmm. They didn't come out with anything by their own. They are just placed there and they play a role. And Alex Jones and David Icke and Tixie Morris, and you can all do very easy research on them and really expose them for what they are. 
but I don't think that you can go back to the game of 1500 and try to expose Martin Luther and where did he really come from and where were his um, influence coming from. I mean, Martin Luther was almost the same age as Ignatius Loyola. Yeah. And I just did a show on Wednesday about that, read uh, chapter 5 of Rulers of Evil, and the irony that they both came out at the same time. Mm -hmm. And one guy, you know, he was out there translating the New Testament into the common people's language, and the other one was developing spiritual exercises and uh, creating a, a way of... Um, uh, I'm not serving the Lord Jesus Christ, but serving uh, uh, Satan. So one was serving Satan, one was serving Jesus. And um, I don't know. It seems the 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 the, the, I, the potential of that happening in that time frame, these two individuals, cannot be by coincidence. <laughs> it's not well, that way. No, it's, it's it's a little bit like when you look into the Bible, you have David and Goliath. They also lived in the same time frame. They had to do it because they were confronted with each other. Right? Right, right. Ignatius of Loyola and Martin Luther also were confronted with each other, but not face to face. That's the only difference. But in their struggle, in what they did, the one got a call for, I have to work for Satan and, 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 and have, to, have to see that Satan got dominion over this whole earth, and that's why he proposed to the Pope a new uh, order of uh, monks or whatever, which the Pope first did not agree to. The Pope only agreed after Ignatius of Loyola introduced to the Pope the fourth oath. Mm -hmm. You knew that, right? Well, yeah, yeah, you know. And then, you know, why did the Pope not too thrilled about that? Because I think they could recognize and see that what Ignatius Loyola was up to was uh, reestablishing the Templar order, if you will, the Templar Knights, and but it was going to be under a different form, a different kind of structure, and they had remem they remembered the past. They remembered what it was like uh, and what happened with their last affiliation with the Templars. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, it, it makes sense why there was this kind of doubt and and suspicion on the papacy's part is this Ignatius Loyola. Here's this guy from Spain, you know, who comes from royalty, part of the Illuminati, the Spanish Illuminati. Los um, Yeah, professing that he wants to serve the uh, the papacy, the Pope. And, uh, and it goes in line with what you were talking about earlier, too, about how these different secret societies were vying for control over the papacy, who was going to be in the papacy, because, you know, whoever's in control the, or has the, the role of the pope and controlling the papacy, they knew that they controlled the world. And they could dictate what was going to happen, so... Now we look at uh, someone like Martin Luther, who was, you know, he was, yeah, he was a Roman Catholic, a Rosicrucian. Um, yet God used this fall of man to translate the New Testament into the people's tongue. Yeah, I don't want to take anything away of his achievements, you know. Martin Luther is, is a person that is very important in our history. But my question remains, why doesn't he go all the way? You have to go a whole nine yards. I don't. I, I think if he did, first of all, I don't think he would have had the support that he needed to have to accomplish what little he did accomplish, which would turn out to be a heck of a lot. Now you can remember how absolutely corrupt Western Europe was at the time, right? And um, absolutely, yeah. So, you know, yeah. I mean. I, it's my impression is this, and it could be completely wrong. But those who did go all the way didn't stay on the planet or, or on this earth very long. 
<laughs> they were like the first ones to be, you know, um, victims of the Inquisition and to be totally destroyed. So I can understand why the early uh, uh, founders of the, Re the Reformation would you know, hang low a little bit, if you will. They would not go all the way just to make sure that the word God got out to people. The truth about Jesus, at least saved by you know the Bible and grace and and you know faith, truth, grace and faith that we can be saved and that I I could see. I mean, look at look at our own personal journey as we make it in a decision ourselves to put Christ first and how in this day and age how that you know and. Uh, what's how it's a word to say? There's not too many of us out there. You know what I mean? Our alliances are small and thin. There's not you're not going to be supported by any major group, and you know you gotta be kind of be the first one to be um, left hanging. You know when things get bad. So I can understand why it happened, and um, you know it's our own personal responsibility. It turns out. Who you know? Are we going to be the one? You or I are going to be the one to take it all the way? And as long as there's an organized religion, it's not going to happen because it's self-preservation of that institution. And um, well, listen, Michael. You know the Bible better than I do, and there's this uh, statement. There's a verse in the New Testament which says. Uh, uh, what has righteousness to do with unrighteousness? How can uh, the light walk with the, uh, with the darkness? Something like that. Uh -huh. You know the point that I'm making? Yeah. So when you, when you, when you see Martin Luther um, doing this reformation and then not going all the way, then you have to say, okay, 90% of the truth and 10% of the lie still is a lie, right? So you have to see that agenda behind that. So maybe... Maybe he didn't address the, uh, the point of the Sabbath because that left the door open for the Roman Catholic Church. Yeah. Like, like freedom of religion left the door open for the Catholics in 1776 and the founding of the United States of America. Well, it definitely did leave the door open. <laughs> no question. Motive, I mean, when you, when you the say motive that, behind it, I don't know why. When you tell the people they can read the Bible, they can read the Word of God in their own language, and they understand, and they all read, keep holy, remember the seventh day to keep it holy. Six days thou shalt do all the labor, and the seventh day is the day of the Lord, and you shall take a rest, something like that in states. Uh -huh. And you give all the people the possibility, and they all go to church on Sunday. What's that all about? It's not logical, you know? It, it leaves something out. Is that... Well, you don't tell me that anybody who is so smart as Luther and all the other reformers who were smart people... I mean, when you can translate the Bible from this language to that language, you're not dumb, right? Right, right. So when you can think so far, and you know, when you read the New Testament, you know that you have to keep the commandments. It's in Revelation 20, I think, or is it even 22, uh, in the end of the Bible, where it said that, and those are the people who were following Christ Jesus and keeping his commandments. That means all ten commandments. And the fourth commandment of remembering and keeping the Sabbath day holy is one of the ten. Well, you know, your point is well taken. I think what the point is is that, you know, maybe I'm wrong. This is what I'm getting from what I'm hearing from you. And what I'm piecing together is that if you look at Martin Luther's backers, I think it was Ferdinand, right? Mm -hmm. And who he was, actually. And we look at the fact that there's this power struggle, struggle going on and who was going to run the papacy and have all these secret societies all kind of vying to, to bring the papacy down so that they could take it over. I thought they didn't really want to get rid of the papacy. They just want to get rid of the ruling 
the ruling families that were controlling the papacy at that time and then put their own people in place, uh, you know, could have been, you know, that's a part of the motive that they had to get the, get him to translate the, tr- the New Testament. Not necessarily for the fact, because you look at Martin Luther's later on in life is how he treated the peasants and what happened with the Jewish thing and all that. He, he kind of, he kind of, uh, kind of came out a, a, a bit of a, a an SOB <laughs> in the end, which, you know, I can understand too why that would be because of all the persecutions he was going through. But, you know, you look at it, it could have been just simply, a, now I'm talking about the motives for those people that were in control in Western Europe at the time. Those were in line with, with Martin Luther backing him. Could those people, their motive really be just to topple the, the papacy, the ruling families that were in the papacy at the time, so they could put their own people in place, and therefore they allowed this to happen. The translation of the New Testament, with never themselves having the intention of actually giving God's people the freedom and the truth of what the you know God's truth, His laws, His commandments, and encouraging them to follow that. And it's quite clear that's the probable case. Um, so, you know, and God works in this, you know, this, this is one of those fine examples that saying how God works in mysterious ways, how he uses the wicked to actually reveal the truth. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Maybe, maybe, Michael, that would be an interesting subject uh, to call in uh, Wayne, Walt, and Tom. Yeah, I think and it was. If you can host me and, and 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 do a broadcast on that discussion, because Mike, I, uh, Wayne, and Tom do have such a deep insight into the Bible um, that make they can maybe come up with an idea, and I think it would be interesting to discuss this point with them on the show. Right. What do you think? Well, it's it's a very valid question. It's an important question that I don't know at the end of the day we can actually get the definitive answer, but we come close to it. Why things happen the way they happen and why they didn't. Well, if we can come to an answer or not, it's not important. That we can discuss this point and bring it to people's attention is more important than right. coming to a, coming to an end of that, don't you think? But you know, it's you know, let's let everyone know who's listening and who will be listening. We're not, this is, you know, I don't think that either one of us are knocking Martin Luther. I think we're trying to understand no, why, no, no, why no, no. it didn't they didn't take it all the way. That's why, you know, because right. life would be so much different in this world if you know the leadership of you know the Reformation. I tell you, what, I tell you one thing: Rome wouldn't have that an easy job to do. If they only had to deal, if they not only had to deal with the Seventh Day Adventists as the only Sabbath keepers openly, and all the other churches keeping the Sunday, if every Reformation, um, every how do you say that, every, every congregation that came out of the Reformation kept the Saturday Sabbath, Rome would have a huge problem today, a huge problem. Oh, or this, it would have been the beginning of the dismantling of... But today they only have the Seventh-day Adventists as one, and they are already since uh, more than 20 years Jesuit infiltrated, and I have a lot of links for that, so anybody who wants to come to me and, and uh, provide the links of the SDA apostasy, I can advise you to go to the site of um, Presence, uh, Presence of God Ministry from Nicholas, um, yeah who has a, a very, very uh, known page on the FDA apostasy. Uh, and I have that also, uh, videos on that, and I have links to that, so that's very interesting. But well, you only I, have Seventh-day Adventists, and you have the Jews, who are the true Sabbath keepers today. And there are even Jews who say that they are already turning to Sunday already with this coming thing. But if you had every reformational... Um, congregation that came out of there, because today we have 20,000, 30,000 different splinter groups of the Reformation Bible came in, coming in there, and every one of these would really keep the Saturday as a holy day, Rome would play another game than they, than they do now. Yeah. Yeah, they definitely would. And, and you know, you look at that, we look at a culture, Western Europe being a sun-worshipping culture that 
honored this Sunday, the first day of the week. And the challenge is that anybody that at that time standing up for the truth that's in the Bible and standing up for the Sabbath day, what they would have gone through, I don't think we can even comprehend it. I mean, look what we go through now wanting to stand for the you know, God's laws and, stand, and keep the Sabbath day. You know, we, we you know, West, whether Western Europe or the Western Hemisphere, you know, it's not, you know, an awful lot of people work on a Saturday. They're not really encouraged to, to, to keep the Sabbath day. They're encouraged to keep the Sunday still. And, um, yeah, I can imagine that the, the pushback just on that one issue alone would have been extremely, it would be tremendous. Yeah, probably. Cause you, okay, maybe let's see that we can get a broadcast on that with uh, with a few of our, our friends together. That would be nice. Yeah. Let's see if you can organize it, if you want to organize it, if you can tip the topic to Wayne and to Tom and to Walt, talk about it, and then we see. But I think we should go on now with our broadcast that I have had planned here. Okay. <laughs> Well, it's, it's obviously it's a question that plagues both you and I. So, you know, yeah, it, it bugs me already a long time. It bugs me already a long time since since I'm a Christian. I said, why didn't uh, Luther uh, teach the the Sabbath? I don't know. But anyway, let's keep from that now and uh, say that it's for another time to talk about. Maybe with some input from some of our listeners also who will react to this uh, broadcast. We will see. And I will, uh, I will go into now occultism. Uh, so we are still on the uh, subject on the Jesuits, the Jesuits and the Vatican, and um, about how occult symbolism is still visible today. When you take, for example, an architecture, Masonic buildings, ancient and new monuments, or places and names, uh, corporate logos, money design. Think of your one billion doll. A one dollar bill, uh, the coat of arms, films, especially those from Hollywood, holy days and other cultural rituals, various public accessible cult religions like Freemasonry, fraternity, scouting, New Age societies. Here are some of the Western rituals and festivals with an occult hidden meaning. So I think this is going to be interesting now. Many of which are strongly influenced by ancient Rome and Roman Catholic priesthood culture. First of all, Christmas, December 24th, December 25th, winter solstice celebration, return of the Son uh, and the Son of God. So return, return of the Son, S-U-N, or return of the S-O-N of God, Son of God. Yeah. I made a video on that last year on the 25th of December called All I Want for Christmas is the Truth About Christmas, and that covers all of that. But uh, Jesus Christ wasn't born on the 25th of December. That is just the day when the sun, after three days resting uh, at the same point, moves the first degree back to the north. And by that is being uh, revived or um, risen from the dead, as they say. The 22nd of December, the sun dies, and then it stays for three days on the same, the 22nd, 23rd, and 24th. It rises on the same space, and then it goes back one degree to the north until it comes to the uh, equinox, what we call today Easter. But that's another thing. So when it comes back to the northern hemisphere. Um, so that's about Christmas. And then we have an interesting uh, news about Valentine's Day for February 14th, where you guys all lay on the feet of your women to please them. What's the background of that? Ancient Rome, and likely even pre-Rome, Lupercalia celebration, was it called. Note, lupus is Latin, Latin for wolf. Lupe means she-wolves. At first, an ancient Roman priesthood fertility ritual, which, later, which was later turned into the Roman Catholic St. Valentine's uh, celebration. <coughs> Sorry. February occurred later on the ancient Roman calendar than it does today, so Lupercalia was held in the spring and regarded as a festival of purification and fertility. Each, each year, on February 15th, the Lupercy priests gathered on Palatine Hill, it's one of the hills of, uh, of Rome, at the cave of Lupercal, 
two naked young men, assisted by the Vestals, the virgin holy female priest of Vesta, sacrificed the dog and the goat at the site. The blood was smeared on the forehead of the young man and wiped away with uh, wool dipped in milk. Roman armies took the Lupercalia customs with them as they invaded France and Britain. One of these was the lottery where the names of the available maidens were placed in a box and drawn out by the young men. Each man accepted the girl whose name he drew as his love for the duration of the festival, or sometimes longer. As Catholicism began to slowly and systematically dismantle the pagan pantheons, it frequently replaced the festivals of the pagan gods with more ecumenical celebrations. It was easier to convert the local population if they could continue to celebrate on the same days. They would just be instructed to celebrate different people and ideologies. Lupercalia, with its lover lottery, had no place in the new Christian order. In the year 496 AD, Pope Galatius uh, I did away with the festival of Lupercalia, citing that it was pagan and immoral. He chose Valentine as the patron saint of lovers, who would be honored at the new festival on the 14th of every February. The festival began with the sacrifice by the Lupercy, or the flaming dials, <coughs> of two male goats and a dog. Next two patrician, uh, patrician young Lupercy were led to the altar to be anointed on their foreheads with the sacrificial blood, which was wiped off the, blood, <coughs> the bloody knife with wool soaked in milk, <coughs> after which they were expected to smile and laugh. The smearing on the forehead with blood probably refers to human sacrifice originally practiced at the festival. The sacrificial feast follows, after which the Lupercy cut thangs from the skins of the, uh, skins of the victims, which were called februa, dressed themselves in the skins of the sacrificed goats in imitation of Lupercus, and ran out of the walls with the old Palatine city, the line which was marked with stones with the, with the tongues in their hands uh, in two bands, striking the people who crowded near. Girls and young women would line up on their route to receive lashes from these wipings. This was supposed to ensure fertility, prevent sterility in women, and ease the pains of childbirth. This tradition itself may survive uh, Christianized shifted to spring in, in, in certain ritual Easter Monday wipings. Well, then you have the uh, festival of Carnival. Immediately before Lent, the 40 days of Catholic liturgical season of fasting and prayer before Easter, usually during February or March. It may last from a few weeks to several months, depending on the region. Well, that's where they uh, take on masks and other people. And uh, actually, that starts in, in, in Germany the 11th of November already, Carnival season. Then you have Easter. Calculated Sunday between March 22nd and April 25th, spring equinox celebration, resurrection of the Son or Son of God, the celebration of the Babylonian goddess of love and fertility, Ishtar. See also the sympathetic goddess Asherah and Astarte, combined with the cosmic egg and rabbit, symbolism of fertility and regeneration. Well, because I've never seen a rabbit lay an egg but uh, it's just symbolism for fertility and regeneration. Uh, regeneration, when you see rabbits go, yeah, okay. See also rebirth and resurrection, the origins of Easter tradition, pagan worship of Easter, blah, blah, blah. Some more words on that. So that's where Easter comes from. And then we have May Day, 1st of May. Phallic Maypole celebration. Um, Axis Mundi on Thalos. The International Workers' Day is the result of traditional culture suppression and industrial political influence. Then you have Halloween, 31st of October, which I like to prefer for as Reformation Day, where there is a death cult celebrated, uh, even within the Roman Catholic Church. And um, then there's bullfighting. Okay, we don't have to go about that. Televised sport events are one modern variant of this occult tradition. Yeah. That's for many people also a holy day when their foot, favorite football team is coming on, you know. The elite know many people want to align themselves with the dominators or winners, not the suppressed, the losers. They hypnotize people with simple systems of glorified male competition and domination. A political harmless commercial venting system for the boredom and anger of many people. Well, let's just say, give them 
bread and cake. I think I'm quite through this article here. We have now coming up here the um, connections with the Jesuits and the sovereign military order of Malta uh, with the so-called black nobility. It's also interesting. Examples are the prominent, but certainly not the most powerful, Rothschild family, who are Knights of Malta, and the Rockefeller family, which are Knights of Malta also, who got started using Rothschild financing for American oil field exploitations. These three financial families, the Rothschilds, Morgans, and Rockefellers, all do the bidding of the Jesuit order because of Jesuit infiltration in their organizations. They do whatever is necessary to destroy constitutional liberty in America and to bring the Pope world domination. As we look back over the 20th century, we see how successful the Jesuits have been. They have continued to squander the wealth of America and continually attack its great constitution and civil liberties. Daily, the power of the Pope in Vatican City increases. One day, they will achieve total power again. These wealthy families function as financial supporters and proxies for the large Jesuit and sovereign military order of Malta mafia banking operations. I think I'm quite through this uh, through this article right now. I don't see anything that is very much interesting here. So I say we are two hours on the air, and we can whether go into the next, which would take as long, or we can do that the next time. But I was going to read an article from the Unhide Mind, the Jesuit domination veiled by diversion agents of deception. That sounds quite interesting to read, but uh, we can do that another time. Uh, it's, up to you. it's up to you, my friend. You can do it now, or I mean, I'm I'm enjoying it. So, so. But if you need a break, you need if you understand. Uh, I'd I'd rather take a break and uh, do that the next time. I can a little bit prepare of that, but uh, I think the two hours that we just had were quite impressive. I mean, uh, I had the intent, uh, I had the idea. It was uh, quite impressive and, and interesting. Oh yeah, a lot, of, a lot of information, as usual, and uh, a lot of food for thought. A lot of, uh, you know, the connections with, uh, you know, what's going on with Martin Luther. I, I, I'm still, to be honest with you, I'm still stuck there trying to figure that one out, <laughs> pondering that, you know, because that is something that always that comes up, and uh, I don't have a great answer to it, so. Well, it's not that you always have to have an answer on something, but sometimes you just need something to think about, you know, and to reflect on. I mean, it's the same with me. You come into the information about well, the Reformation, okay, how do we see the Reformation? Yeah, why didn't they go all the way? There had to be a reason, uh, whether it was a reason why they were, because they were infiltrated, because they were controlled of the position, because it was, it was wanted that way. I mean, when you read the Bible, and I, I want to finish with that, but when you read the Bible, and it speaks about the 1260 years that um, the Vatican is ruling, that is the period between 538, when the Vatican came into full power, and 1798, when General Berthier sent by Napoleon to arrest the Pope. All right? right. Yeah. First of all, Napoleon was Jesuit controlled and was a 33 degree Mason. So that means that God, in his prophecies, in his doings, also uses the enemy to fulfill his prophecy. All the time. Right. <laughs> right. But mm. can you tell me why this wonderful and important? maybe maybe 31st of October 1517 when Luther nailed the 95 pieces on the church door or this uh, where we were talking about this uh, concert, um, this, uh, this meeting in Spire that they had in 1529 where the word Protestant first came up uh -huh. why these days are they not mentioned in the Bible if the Reformation is so important because 1798, that is already 180, 170 years past the Reformation, right? Right. 
the Reformation itself is never mentioned in the Bible. If I understand it right, so then I think if that really was a move of God, wouldn't it, wouldn't He have written it in His book? Well, it's, it's, it's a very good question, and and uh... well, maybe we can discuss it in a bigger group, um, and and uh, we'll see to that later. But, uh, You know, trying to make heads or tails with a lot of what's going on in the world uh, and then connecting it with the Bible uh, is a bit of a challenge. I mean, it really is not just a bit of a challenge. It is a challenge, and uh, if one is honest about that, you know. So and one thing that I am discovering as I go down this journey and I, as I think I got it all figured out, someone like you shows up and asks some pertinent questions and gets, me, <laughs> gets my brain thinking again and gets me you know, questioning whether what I know to be true is actually the truth. And um, I think it's a healthy way of going about it. I know for a lot of folks, it's scary. Uh, I know a lot of folks, it's, it's disturbing because, you know, you get set in your mindset, your mind, in your ways, that you have it all figured out. But, you know, we are not God. We're, no. just, we're just mere men. And um, so we are unfortunately just full of a bunch of nonsense and lies and, and um, so we don't have hardly even close to all the answers you know about what has been going on in this world and in our lives so I put my faith in my in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior the only begotten Son and uh, that has helped me immensely in this journey has given me hope and um but, you know, I can also understand why somebody who doesn't have faith in him would not have faith in him based on one's own understanding, you know what I mean? So, um, And as far as the Bible goes, why is it not to talk more about what happened in the Reformation? Why why don't we have a, a more, um, you know, heck, not just, you know, counter-Reformation? Welcome, there's not much talking about today, you know what I mean? It's, the... Um, yeah, something happened along the way. I, and I think a lot of it has to do with what we brought up earlier about this whole idea of keeping the Ten Commandments, God's people. Um, how long has it been since God's people have, you know, been here? If that makes any sense. In other words, I'm not saying there, there has not been God's people on the planet or the earth here during the Reformation or whatever the past 2,000 years, but um, this, I don't know, it almost seems like, you know, after the Christ's resurrection and and, and the death of, uh, of Stephen, that things really got really dark, really, really dark. Mm-hmm. And I don't think we fully comprehend how dark that is. We're just now coming out of the darkness, if you will, the dark ages. And uh, people will argue and say otherwise, but uh, you know, when I say coming out, I, that's not a full, complete coming out. I don't think we, we are ever going to completely come out until the second coming, you know? So, I hope it didn't sound too cryptic, but the problem is, if we're honest men, we don't have a lot of the answers to these questions. But they're worthy of debate and discussion, and just see if we can find the answer. That's but, why. But we don't have a lot of the answers that you just. It's the questions that you brought up. It's not about having the answers, Michael. It's about asking the questions, and it's about seeing that these questions need to be asked. Yeah, they do. They do. I think it brings a lot of humility to a man, and it brings him back down. To the level that he really is, he's just a man. No matter how bright we are, or what uh, our abilities are, we're not God. So, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> so I, and I'm sure everything I just said is not satisfactory. But that's, I wish I had something more profound to say, but I really don't. So, oh, that's that's all right. That's all right. I didn't, I didn't ask more than that, but 
Let's see. Let's see if we can get the other guys to come in and do a broadcast together on that subject if they want to. That could be very interesting. Yeah, well, I will get a hold of them and, and let's see. Maybe they'd be willing to do that sometime. Uh, if, if, if most of us should be free, we try and do it later on in the week, next week, and we'll discuss. Um, you know why they didn't take it all away, the, the reformers. Uh, why did they not go go for it as far as the Sabbath? Um, and um, why there's why is there such a such a black hole, if you will, um, when it comes to our history for the as Christians in the past two thousand years? Now I love I know a lot of folks will say, well, you know, we got all that early early church age history, but you know, can one truly be honest? Can one be honest and say that how much of that is accurate? We don't know. Nope. Really, a lot of that that the, the history of Christianity, I mean, has really been um, tampered with terribly. And um, yeah, you know, there's also other subjects because if, if you if you want to start questioning the Bible translations, then you can start uh, questioning about uh, first of all using the name Jesus in, in, instead of Yeshua. You can say why is there Amen in the Bible and um, doesn't that come from Egypt? Amen Ra and. Uh, I will point here to Wayne's website, Avenue of Light, where he has an article about that, where right. uh, the word Amen that is first used, I think, in, uh, in Exodus, in the Bible, when they already are out of Egypt, they brought that word out of Egypt. And, and I, I happen to, to agree. I, I mean, I don't end my prayers with Amen, but let's not get lost here in the details right now and then these little things. Let's just say, okay, we've had our broadcast tonight. Uh, I enjoyed myself reading that uh, that article that I found there on the connection on the Jesuits and the Vatican and the, the Supreme Military Order of Malta connecting all the dots after we came from that uh, travel uh, from Ellis Bailey her, her ten points from Lucifer's trust or Lucy's trust to the Ten Commandments of the Devil where I still have to make a video from I have to say. <laughs> Uh, probably next weekend or so I'm, I'm going to do that. And then I will link it, of course, with the links of the radio show that we did on that also. So um, we have had uh, quite some kind of a travel. I have, uh, like I told you, prepared a little articles uh, that we can do next time when we do our show. I would see okay. and, uh, by this, I would say I bring it to an end and uh, leave it up to you to see if the other brothers of us are interested in a, making a broadcast about the things that we just stated and discussed this reformation subject because I think that can be could be very interesting but uh, as far as I'm concerned for tonight I thank the listeners to uh, listen to me and of course to you giving me thank you very much the opportunity to speak here on the show yeah that's been great. I hope to be invited again and uh, it's Sunday night here, uh, so I hope everybody will have a nice week. And if I don't see anybody before the next Sabbath, I wish everybody to have a nice uh, coming up Sabbath next week. And uh, God bless you and all your families. And uh, thanks for listening, and bye-bye. Okay. Hopefully we can have one uh, Wednesday or Thursday again. Um, yeah, and um, yeah, it was really good, folks. And... Uh, for those, you know, I know we we ask some quote unquote dangerous questions that get, will challenge a man's faith in Lord Jesus Christ. But you know, I see it this way: uh, since I've been doing this and asking the honest questions, my faith in Jesus Christ has actually increased. My need for a savior has increased, believe it or not. Um, so by asking these kind of questions. Um, I can see only one thing. A man or a woman can grow from it. So. And with that, everybody have a great day. Um, so far, next week, I definitely have scheduled uh, Thursday night, uh, Romanism and the Reformation 2014. We'll be talking about flattery, led by uh, Tom Fress. And then um, I imagine there'll be a couple more shows. Hopefully, Jorg and I will get together Wednesday, Thursday, and we'll see if we can get some other folks to join us in the discussion. 
either or. So um, with that, everyone have a good day. And thanks for those who have listened. And have a good day. All right, bye-bye. See you, York. See you. All right, bye-bye.